we can actually see your faces. We're also very nice people. <laughs> Hopefully you will. You can, yeah, no, no. sit in those reserve seats. You just spread out, feel important because you are.
She also read in the proposal that they said this, uh, the harvesting of the timber wouldn't actually have any negative effects on any of the animals that lived in the old growth. And so she went out with a couple of members of the Audubon Society and actually took photos of a number of different uh, threatened species in the area, uh, such as mountain lions, salamanders, owls, uh, beavers, which are res responsible and sustainable loggers, uh, and put that, again, onto her Earth story. And then she took that uh, map to town hall meeting and, and used the map and a flyover to essentially show her community, hey, this is what they're proposing and this is the impact on not only of our, on our lives, but the environment. And is this worth it? And this tour ended up getting the support of local politicians, um, Santa Clara County Board and supervisors, and <coughs> uh, caught attention in some local news media. But what was really important is bringing that map and bringing that visualization and data helped everyone else understand something that wasn't really clearly articulated to them before. It's that power of imagery <coughs> and laying something out in a, a way that really connects back to your individual experience. And so uh, this resident of the community points out it's a three-dimensional presentation giving an amazing topographic bird's eye view of how invasive that logging will be. And from there, what was really amazing, it obviously picked up local media, but all across the United States and uh, around the world, people started reporting on how this, um, oh, actually, I realize we do a connect sound, so I'm not gonna play it, but there's a flyover. These, these slides will be available after, um, after our presentation today. But what you'll see is local me news media using the Earth Tour to showcase the impact of Rebecca's work. Uh, and two years later, after the effort of working with the community and building up the Earth Stories and, and kind of popularizing it, in 2007, they actually discovered that the proposal was illegal and they were able to stop all of the, uh, the intent to harvest timber together. Uh, and so this essentially concludes that uh, the timberland is protected as a public resource that cannot uh, be used by uh, other entities. And so the point of this entire story is the community came together, they went up against a very large and well-funded company and stopped the logging outright. And I just learned that the, the entire proposed area for that harvesting of timber is actually now an open space preserve in California. So it's going to be protected um, uh, for hopefully all, all time to come. So that was 2005, 2007, uh, a good number of time ago. But that, that whole project and uh, using Earth in, in a way for uh, public impact launched our team. So what was a Google 20% project, just a passion of Rebecca's, uh, formed into an initiative where Google would offer resources, engineers, product um, visionaries, and program managers like myself to kind of help sustain. And so what we think about every single day is how can we take all of our different mapping technology and put them into your hands to help solve some of the world's most pressing problems. And so now I'm going to take you to another part of the world, the Brazilian rainforest. Uh, this is Chief Omir of the Surawi, uh, a tribe really in the heart of the Amazon that didn't have contact with the outside world until 1969. Uh, but over the course of years, uh, a highway was put relatively close to their community. And when the highway came, the large semis and trucks came, and soon clear cutting uh, was surrounding their community. And that clear cutting is for both limber, farmland, and cattle. Uh, and they noticed that the rainforest around them was slowly shrinking, and that was impacting their hunting grounds, their sacred sites, and just their general life patterns. Uh, and, and ultimately really influencing their culture and their, their livelihood. 
And what Chief O'Meara recognized is that they had no way to, to measure the scope of the devastation, communicate what was happening, or provide data to authorities that could actually help them manage uh, the deforestation that was encroaching onto their territory. And so Chief Almir uh, decided, hey, I need to go out. I need to go um, learn how to address these issues. So he was the first um, member of his tribe to actually go to university. And it just so happened he was in an internet cafe in 2007. What pops up? Google Earth. Where do 99.9% .9 of people go when they open up Earth and maps and street view? They go to their house. They go to their home. And so, or, and then they look at their neighbor's backyard, and then they go to their grandmother's house. Uh, but of course, what he pulled up was his own territory. <coughs> and what he saw was the deforestation that was coming around from this entirely new perspective. And so grasping that the satellite imagery could really change people's perspective and understanding of their, their situation, as well as conserve his people's um, land, heritage, languages, and traditions, he traveled over 5,000 miles to Google headquarters to meet with uh, my boss, Rebecca Moore, and tell her his story. Um, and of course, she, when he came and visited her, she immediately went to the north and was able to see the 2,600 square kilometers of his territory that was still protected and managed by them. And so, um, Rebecca and my team went back to Brazil and actually trained the entire community of how they could use Google Earth, satellite imagery, and uh, data collection to monitor their forest. And so here's an example of uh, a, a map that they created using their own icons that outlines sacred sites where people live, where people hunt, where to find herbs. Uh, they created different YouTube videos and geotagged uh, a lot of important content both for themselves and for, um, uh, for their elders and for their students. Uh, they also started um, adding photos and videos of illegal logging to report back to the authorities. And so um, in combination, it was, it was truly a community effort to come and, and map everything uh, in a way that was understandable to people outside of the community. And so they effectively were able to, one, galvanize energy to uh, protect their area. So they had increased local authority monitoring the, the logging of the particular situation. They used open data kit to measure the assets and uh, size of their forced carbon offset um, to trade on the carbon credit market. Um, and so they are actually the first indigenous group to be recognized, fully recognized in the carbon marketplace and uh, receive money for, for not cutting down their forest. And uh, <coughs> there are 120,000 tons of offsets to Natura. They actually are no longer part of this um, community, but their, their work still goes on. And so what happened after the survey we had so much success, other indigenous groups reached out to our community and wanted the same type of training to preserve their resources. And so what we see here is a time lapse of deforestation in Brazil, but also indigenous Brazilian um, territories in the Amazon. And you can see there's a direct correlation between uh, forests that are maintained and owned by those indigenous populations and their preservation uh, with the clear cutting that surrounded them. And in fact, uh, of part, uh, indigenous territories overlap with approximately 80% of, of the plant diversity that we see in, in the Amazon. So highly, highly important. And they're very effective, sustainable land managers. Another community uh, are the Quilombas, which are descendants of the slaves um, that were brought to Brazil. Um, just last year, they were able to use Google Earth and ODK to effectively um, uh, argue for their land rights um, after really a 23 long struggle to be recognized. Um, and so this also connects to the importance of using that geodata to people's socioeconomic livelihoods um, and how mapping work can, again, change the perspective and understanding of, of how and where people live. And, uh, and then last but not least, we have the, the Tembe community also just this last year 
uh, were able to stop a criminal scheme with the Brazilian police um, that came up to more than six million dollars per month of illegal harvesting activity in their um, in the territory that they live in. Uh, so their evidence of what was happening actually compelled the law enforcement to go out and take active measures to stop that criminal activity. And so why am I here? So it's wonderful that we're bringing all these different uh, tools and resources and data sets to um, nonprofits, scientists, researchers, and educators. But what, what I want to do is really flip it around and bring it to more students. How can we make everyone a data scientist? How can we make everyone a cartographer? Uh, and how our program works is we do a lot of training uh, and outreach. We work with partners um, on projects and stories at scale. We have software grants and, and online resources. But essentially, I take that full right-hand side of tools and think about how can we make these accessible, how can we make them free, and how can we have the right information that educators need on a daily basis? And what will students be interested in? And so while Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it as accessible and easy as possible for anyone to use, our team is now thinking a lot about how do we make Earth observation data accessible and possible through Google Lens. And I fundamentally believe if we put this in the hands of students, of young people, we are going to equip them for a better future, and we're going to give them a skill set that is essentially required in every single STEM role that I am aware of. And so, our question to you uh, is what would happen if young people across the world uh, could take data science into their own hands? What are the questions that they would ask? What would they bring to policy makers and leadership? And what are the skills that we can help equip them with um, so that they can operate in this highly globalized and connected world? And with that, I want to switch over to two very inspirational high school students um, that are going to talk about Earth Engine. scale environmental changes that Emily just talked about in the Amazon, for example. So most of you are probably familiar with at least some of the satellites that you're seeing on this screen, Landsat, CloudSat, these are all NASA satellites. There are dozens of satellites from NASA and ESO, which is the European Space Agency, and other agencies around the world that are currently orbiting Earth. Um, most of us know satellites as a means of um, getting internet or GPS, but um, what we use satellites for is something Kind of on the flip side, we use satellites to get a bird's eye view of some of the land cover and land use changes that are, were occurring around the world. So the object of a lot of our work with Google Earth has been taking these satellite images and trying to give them to students in a way that makes um, what would ordinarily be sort of boring lessons from textbooks and statistics and making those more engaging. So how do we actually get access to all of these satellite images? This is where a program called Google Earth Engine comes in. You can think of Earth Engine as kind of the back end of Google Earth. It's where we're able to actually access and harness all of those satellite data that I showed you before um, in an open source way. So all of this, these data are completely free and open to the public. And the idea of Earth Engine is we're able to get access to things like climate and weather data, atmospheric data, high res data, um, also things like geophysical and terrain data, basically name a type of geophysical data that has a location and chances are Earth Engine has it. Um, and I also invite you all to check out this link at the bottom. This is the full Earth Engine data catalog where you're able to um, experiment with a lot of the different data sets and um, cloud base that we have to offer. So just to kind of highlight a couple of the more prevalent data sets that we see people using, we have real-time temperature data going back to 1950 and also through projections. So we're able to see how the climate has changed in the long term. We also have things like high-res imagery if we're looking at really small-scale trends like deforestation in the Amazon where it might impact just one particular village, for example. We have things like climate data where we're able to, in addition to temperature, also track things like precipitation in the long term and extreme weather events and how they've changed over time. Um, and also things like terrain data if you want to check out your local region as well. 
So the idea behind Earth Engine is we're able to take these different satellite imagery data sets, apply algorithms in the cloud. Most of the processing that we do is in JavaScript or Python. That's how we're able to download and, um, and process the imagery. And we have many real-world applications as to how we're actually able to apply those data sets to solving really large-scale problems. So how is all of this processing done? You can see here, this is an example of the Earth Engine code editor. At the top, where it says search places and data sets, that's where you're able to essentially search any data set you want from the catalog and then process all of the data, as you can see, using code here, and then visualize the results in real time around the world. Um, now, there are many really important scientific applications that have come out of this. This is primarily a research tool. Um, so just to highlight um, kind of the keystone examples of how Earth Engine has been applied in the past, this was really the first large-scale application of Earth Engine by a scientist. Um, Professor Matt Hansen from University of Maryland and his team mapped the extent of all forest gains and losses over the past 20 years. Um, this would have taken months and months, if not years, to process without Google Earth Engine, but because of the speed of the cloud processing, they were able to process the extent of all forest change in the 21st century in just a couple days. Um, and kind of extending that idea. The Global Surface Water Mapping Project has mapped all changes in global surface water, so oceans, lakes, rivers, again, in the 21st century, um, and again, speeding up processing considerably. But we have a problem. While these applications are really um, useful and um, engaging for scientists and the whole scientific community, for students, something like the code editor, I think, could be really intimidating. Um, because you're not only going to have to get used to the whole um, the science pro the science concepts behind um, what we're doing in Earth Engine, but also some of the JavaScript coding. So the way that we're solving that is communicating these data sets using what we call Earth Engine apps. So these Earth Engine apps <coughs> essentially give you the data sets and the data visualizations, but without all of the processing in the JavaScript and Python code editor. So they're dynamic and they're public publicly accessible user interfaces that are um, available for everyone, regardless of whether you have an Earth Engine account or know anything about satellite data whatsoever. So through the Earth Engine Education Project, we're creating a series of apps that cover um, many main science concepts that we see covered in Earth and space and biology classrooms. So including things like the carbon cycle or biodiversity, um, things like climate, population change, forests, um, and we're continuously creating these apps, and so any ideas that you might have um, for how these Earth Engine data sets can apply to your classroom, we're very open to suggestions. Um, so now we'd like to transition into some demos of what the apps actually look like.